The opinions expressed on this program are those of the program hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the station, management, staff, or sponsors. WPSL does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WPSL. Eleven oh seven at WPSL fifteen ninety, the talk of the Treasure Coast, and you're on Sun Palm Financial Broadcast with Sandra Liliana, who is not here today because she is working very hard <laughs> at the office. And David Cummings, where you invest, grow, and protect. Good morning, sir. Hey. I want to welcome all of our uh, folks here to the Sun Palm Financial Broadcast, where we talk all things money. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Sandra Liliana, my co-host today, is uh, handling some appointments for us. Been pretty busy. Uh, I'm your host, D. Thomas Cummings. My friends and clients do call me Dave. Uh, we're broadcasting to you live from the Treasure Coast of Florida, and we are heard worldwide on Alexa, Google Home, uh, TuneIn app, and other platforms. Uh, so today's topic, what are we going to be talking about? Well, today we're going to be talking about the conditions of the U.S. banks. We'll also peek into the global um, financial world a little bit. We're going to talk about some concerns that may be uh, brewing uh, potential recessions. We're going to also be talking about uh, looking at commercial real estate, see how that might factor into the future here for 2024. Uh, today's date is February 21st, 2024. It's 11.08 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So wherever you are in the world listening to us, uh, we welcome you uh, to the Sun Palm Financial Broadcast. Uh, we'd like to know what you have to think about uh, the future of 2024, the banks, the situation with the global uh, economy. Uh, you can call in to us, 772-340-1590. That's 772-340-1590. We'd love to hear from you. So what do you think? Are the banks uh, stable or do we have some problems brewing in the future? <clears throat> that will be the topic. Now, before we get started, I wanted to advise that we might all uh, also be making some financial decisions and suggestions uh, during the broadcast. So I'd like to read out a quick disclaimer for you. Uh, so the information opinions obtained this broadcast have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable. They are given for informational purposes only, and the information is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions or as a solicitation to sell. All right, so now for the topic. So condition of the U.S. banks. We're going to also be talking about upcoming commercial real estate and uh, some other issues that are going on there. But uh, recap from uh, the last couple shows that we had. Uh, first show we were talking about Social Security. Is it going to be around when we retire? Uh, the uh, fund that manages the Social Security Administration, they said it would be insolvent coming up here in about mm, 20, maybe 10 years, less than that. Uh, so there were some uh, patchwork that they were looking at doing up in Congress to fix this. Uh, so check that show out. We're on uh, WPTV um, on YouTube. So definitely want to check out that show. And then <clears throat> we were also talking about uh, some other things that were a bit of a concern as we look into the financial world. But right now, the key topic that we're looking at is essentially the banking system, U.S. banking system. How stable is it? Where are things right now? So let's first recap from 2023. So 2023, uh, it was a kind of a rocky year. We had five major banks uh, collapse. So I'm going to give you a list of those and when they happen. So uh, of course, November was the most recent, November 2023 on the 3rd, uh, Citizens Bank in Sac City, Iowa closed. Um, also, Heartland Tri-State Bank uh, in Kansas, they closed in July on July 28th. The First Republic Bank of San Francisco, uh, they closed in May on May 1st, 2023. And so here, that was a, a big hit there. Um, and then we had two very large banks, which really surprised people. We had the Signature Bank of New York. Uh, they, they collapsed on um, March the 12th. And then Silicon Valley Bank, that one got a lot of news um, on March the 10th. So very scary when you're looking across the scope of uh, the U.S. landscape and you're saying, okay, well, how stable is the banking system? And 
obviously when you see banks failing and dropping uh, like this, there's a bit of a concern. So is it stable now? That's the next question. So we, we had five banks go down in 2023. What is 2024 looking like? Uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit, but we'll, we'll touch on some of that. So right now, these are some recent announcements that uh, I've done some research on. Uh, in 2024 here, PNC Bank has announced 19 branches are set to be closed. It's a lot of branches. Um, even more so, Huntington Bank, 34 branches are going to be closed by the end of March. So this is, this is pretty, pretty heavy. So that's not even by the end of the year, it's by March. So when you look at those um, situations, the question is, you know, is it bad? Is my money safe in the bank? Uh, what should I do when it comes to investing? Should I move it around? You know, kind of how, how, how did we even get to that point? So I'm going to be quoting some research. Mark Thompson at uh, CNN Business did a deep dive into some of this. It was really great information. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of quote some of it and share it with you. Uh, so the U.S. government's Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation took control of SVB, that's uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and it was the biggest bank collapse in America since Washington Mutual in 2008. Uh, the wheels started to come off uh, 48 hours earlier when the bank took a multi-billion dollar loss, uh, cashing out U.S. government bonds to raise money to pay debtors. And they tried unsuccessfully to sell shares to shore up its finances, and that triggered a panic which led to its downfall. Uh, a similar thing happened a few days later at Signature Bank after they made a run on the deposits by customers. And uh, so that's kind of a scary thing. So in order to kind of understand how this can happen, we first have to understand the system. So in order to understand our financial system, and some of this, I'll just be honest with you, it's going to be a surprise for most people. I don't think most people even understand how the banking system works. They just know they go to the bank, they put in money, they pull out money, they cash checks. Um, you know, there's funds availability policies and they fight with the manager to make it, you know, available sooner. <laughs> so, uh, so how does the banking system even work? Now, the thing you have to understand is banks are only required to keep a uh, certain amount of cash in reserves uh, for what they bring in in deposits. Uh, so how much is the question? Uh, so 10% is the required reserve ratio against the net transaction deposits of low reserve and 3% is required uh, reserve ratio against the net transactions in the lower reserve. What does that mean? Essentially what that means when you walk into a bank, let's say you're just gonna deposit a million dollars into the bank. Only a small fraction of that uh, money that you put into a deposit remains in cash. Um, so where's the rest of it go? It's a natural question. Well, the majority of your money is then lent out to others. And the interest gained um, from that uh, lending grows the money for the bank, as well as origination fees, other types of fees and floats. So let's kind of put that into perspective. So you walk in, you give them a million dollars, they're going to only keep a small portion of that, the rest of it, they're going to be lending out to homeowners who want to buy a house, uh, maybe small business loans, these kinds of things. And they charge an origination when you get a mortgage, obviously. So that's their fee that they charge big fee. Uh, several thousand dollars. So they have automatically recouped or gained if you want to call it that several thousand dollars from origination and fees and then the interest that comes in and so that's one major way that banks uh, make money the other one that they make is fees so like if you use some someone's uh, ATM machine it might charge you three bucks well if you do that times however many uh, ATM uh, transactions that's a lot of money uh, the other way that they make money is through the float so this is something not a lot of folks understand Let's say you're going to send money or there's a direct deposit from your, your employer going into your account. It doesn't hit immediately. Where does it go? So first it will go into the bank's uh, float deposit account, essentially, and it'll be there for one day, three days, however long funds availability uh, permits them, and then it goes into your account. So basically that gives uh, an opportunity if there's a uh, money being recalled back or if there's a bad check, they don't lose it. 
Uh, but really what it is, it's, a, it's an account that's interest bearing and they're making money off of the float. So if you think of how many transactions like this are happening, um, it's, it's a staggering amount of money. So <clears throat> now banks also pay me money when I put my money in. So let's say I put the money in a CD, certificate of deposit or other interest bearing account, savings accounts, money markets. Uh, the bank will pay, pay you a few percentage points. Uh, so savings accounts, very low. Um, CDs, I think the best ones we're seeing now, somewhere in the you know, early, uh, low to mid fives, uh, five percent. But if they're making seven percent on a mortgage, plus thousands in origination, uh, also maybe nine to 10 percent on their auto loans, boat loans. Uh, if it's a bank that has a credit card established brand, uh, they're probably pulling 22%, somewhere like this. So this is some big uh, money coming in for the bank. And of course, it's easier for them to then pay you your 5.2% on your CD. So if you want to think about it, money grows from nothing. Uh, you put your money in and they grow your money, uh, credit it back to the financial institution, and this is ultimately done, growing money is done through debt, short version. So by creating debt, we create you know, a need. The need supplies uh, interest, which creates money. So if you can comprehend that, then you have really got your head wrapped around this thing because bottom line is we are a debt-driven society. So this is why we always you know, see these credit card ads coming in the uh, in the mail and this is why people are always wanting you to do debt consolidation loans and buy a house and lend 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 we'll give you all this money right so where do the banks get the money the banks get the money from the federal reserve so what is the federal reserve most people think it's a federal bank well not necessarily uh, federal reserve is not even part of the federal government it's a private central bank um, and if you want to learn more about that, because I, I could do just a whole show deep dive on that, but if you want to learn more about that, there's a really great book that came out some years ago. It's called The Creature, uh, Creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, so The Creature from Jekyll Island, really great book on the subject. You can also YouTube it and listen to the audio version of it. Uh, but it's essentially where a group of bankers all got together uh, back in the day. They met on Jekyll Island to create the central banking system for the United States. Um, and so this private Federal Reserve Bank sets the monetary policy uh, from unelected uh, bureaucrats, basically. And with this uh, monetary policy, they lend uh, banks at an interest rate. And then, of course, the banks mark it up and, and so forth. Um, yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. I, I always assumed the Federal Reserve was part of the federal government. It, and it's very, it's very um, confusing because when you hear the Federal Reserve, the first thought is it's part of the federal government, um, but it's not. So it's a private organization. So and that's why nobody can tell the head of the Fed what to do. Exactly. It's a private bank. Oh, okay. Exactly. That's and making sense. Uh, uh, Rand Paul, uh, he's been you know, really outspoken on this. I think his dad, Ron Paul, was as well. Um, and the idea here is that they were doing the, hey, audit the Fed, audit the Fed. We need to audit the Fed, right? So really what they were saying is, how do we even know that the Fed has money? What, you know, how do we know this? You know, let's see how much, because when the Fed lends money, really all they're doing is sending ones and zeros, right? And then, so then the bank, then takes those ones and zeros and creates actual money through debt. And this is what's called a fiat system of currency. So right now you're probably scratching your head and you're like, this can't be true. I'm sorry, it is. <laughs> it is absolutely the case. Uh, if you'd like to call in, give your two cents, 772-340-1590, if you'd like to uh, ask a few questions about this um, or talk about it, give your, your opinion, love to hear from you. So really, if you think about it, we hear all the time these these fraudsters and Ponzi schemers, right? Um, so what are they doing? They're kind of doing a similar thing, right? So they they take your money, right? And they promise you a certain return, and then they use your money to do whatever. And then from the interest that's coming in from the whatever, they're paying it to you. 
and you just kind of hope that there's actually, you know, <laughs> going to be a return. You're going to get some money back, right? Uh, looks like we're getting some calls. Hang on. <laughs> looks like we have a call coming in. Bear with me just a minute. Our engineer is uh, taking that one. All right, looks like we have a call on the line. We'll go ahead and bring them in. Bear with us just a minute. This is uh, Sun Palm Financial Broadcast. You are on the air. What's your question? This is a very good question. And obviously, you're paying attention. <laughs> so, well, think about it this way. When you go and you put your money in the bank, you're hoping that the bank doesn't fail like what we just talked about. So, uh, but if it does, they have something called FDIC insurance, right? So what is the FDIC insurance? That's the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Keyword insurance. We're going to talk about that in more detail, right? So basically it's like this. An insurance company is outside of the typical financial world in the respect that they operate on a different set of rules, different set of laws, and so forth. So one of the safest places you can put your money right now, which would be out of the stock market, it'd be out of the banking system, basically, is in an insurance type of product. So one of the best ones for investment would be maybe an annuity. Um, there are at Sun Palm Financial right now, that's probably the thing that uh, people are asking for. They want to put their money in an annuity. You have a great interest rate on some, so we, we get A-rated companies, best rates. You can get high percentage rates for life, no exposure to the stock market uh, or loss of principal. And you're outside of the banking system. That's a really good one. That's one that a lot of people are moving towards. Um, if you don't have a lot of money to put into an account, uh, there's, there's some other life insurance types of products that also can gain interest. Uh, IULs, we talk about, um, I think we talked about these last week. One of those, uh, IUL stands for Index Universal Life. So basically, if you put your money into a life insurance product, but you can index it to the stock market, meaning not invest, but it, it kind of matches the performance of certain indexes like the S&P 500, and then what happens is your money grows, but it's not exposed to uh, the market if it happens to collapse or things go bad. So that's another uh, way that you can start growing money uh, and where you can put it safely. Uh, the other one, of course, uh, real estate. Real estate's a really great uh, thing to, uh, to invest in uh, because you can walk down the street and look at your investment. You see it, you know it's there and so on. But in order to turn that real estate into an income, you'll have to rent it. And then, of course, you get into the landlord game. Uh, there's always going to be upkeep. Uh, last week, we talked about the cost of insurance and the cost of taxes are so high now that uh, landlords are just not making any money. And that's why even the rents as high as they are, it's, it's just not uh, performing very well. So we had made the recommendation last week. It's probably a good time now that the... Um, the values of homes are high. Um, and at the same time, we also have interest rates in certain areas, investments high. Uh, it would be a good time to sell and drop it into maybe a lifetime annuity uh, that's given some good, good payments. So great question, great question. Thank you for calling in. Uh, so we've got some more information here. We talked about the Federal Reserve. These are the guys that are private bank, central bank, and they're setting the monetary policy. They're uh, they're lending uh, from basically, we don't know where it's coming from, ones and zeros. And then as debt is created, money is created back into the system. And this is why we kind of have this, uh, I guess you can call it a debt-driven society, uh, because that's how these guys grow money and, and, and make money. So we have a fiat currency, means it's not necessarily backed by something solid like gold. Now. If you've done your homework, uh, you know that back uh, when Nixon was president, we used to be on the gold standard, meaning that our US dollar was backed by gold, right? So when Mr. Nixon came into office, we got off of the gold standard. 
and we became this fiat currency. So the question most people would ask is, okay, well, what is backing the US dollar now? If it's not gold, what is backing the US dollar? So uh, essentially what's backing it now is, and I'll quote it, the full faith and credit of the United States. That's your guarantee. So you're sitting here saying that's it? Sort of. Um, what, but in order to understand that part, we kind of have to understand what is the US government? This is another big shocker for a lot of people. The US government is actually a corporation. Um, when the country was founded and settlers came over, the corporation was actually the crown. Uh, they established a um, basically a new corporation, which was uh, literally chartered as a corporation of the people. Um, uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, David, I think it's Seeply, I think is how it's pronounced. He put it this way. I thought it was really good. He said, the U.S. Constitution is best understood not as a social contract, but more popularly, it's, an, it's a corporate charter. And uh, the leading founders considered this new government a literal chartered corporation of the people. Now, before you say, I don't believe you, I'll read the definition. This is from the U.S. Code, USC, uh, 28 U.S.C., 3002, 15. Here's the definition of the United States. United States means A, a federal corporation, B, an agency, department, commission, board, and other entity of the United States, and C, an instrumentality of the United States. You uh, live in a corporation, and it's a corporation that's you know, supposed to be governed by the people. But when we came off the gold standard, what really happened is you became the product. That's right. So when we say that the United States dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, which is supposedly by the people for the people, you became the product. So Go ahead. So, so are there gold uh, reserves at all, or is Fort Knox a myth? <laughs> so this is another great question. People have wanted to audit Fort Knox. They've wanted to look at it and see how much is in there. But, of course, the response would be, well, who cares, because it's no longer backed by the U.S. dollar. So the United States, our economy, our people, the way we operate, our way of life is the insurance to the world. There's a couple other factors that we're gonna hit on that also play in here, right? Um, so let me get it pulled up here. Yeah, so number one is we are uh, the world reserve currency. Now, when we come back from our break here, we're gonna talk about that. So let's go to the break. And then if you wanna call us when you come back in from the break, 772-340-1590, we'll talk about it. And stay with us for the uh, for first Sun Palm Financial. Just a moment. are you willing to chase them before giving up? Or are you willing to stay the course to achieve them? Do you dare believe? Are you willing to work for them, strive hard to never give up until they are realized? Are your dreams worth chasing? Well, if they are, welcome to Sun Palm Financial a place where dreams become a reality. Whether your dream is to grow and to thrive towards the good life or to simply experience freedom through financial security, come share your dreams with us. Sun Palm Financial, invest, grow, protect. SunPalmFinancial.com Old money. Why is old money respected more than new? It's not because new money spends their fortunes outrageously and the old money gets jealous. Old money is respected because it has grown over time, 
and is maintained over many, many generations. You see, most new money will be blown eventually or wasted by the second generation. And the descendants of new money just get poorer and poorer after that. But at Sun Palm Financial, we'll help you to create generational wealth that will grow with each new chapter. So if you've been fortunate enough to come into some new money, or right now to schedule your free consultation so that you can join the old club. Some Palm Financial. Invest. Grow. Protect. SunPalmFinancial.com And welcome back to the Sun Palm Financial Broadcast. And if you'd like to join uh, uh, Dave Cummings in conversation, 772-340-1590. All right, we're back. The conversation of the day is U.S. banks. How safe are they? How's this whole system work? What's the future look like after 2023? We had five banks go down. Uh, is this going to be just the start of a bigger problem or was that a one-off? Uh, we had a great uh, question from one of our callers just called in said, hey, where's a safe place to put your money that's not a bank? Uh, we talked about annuities, uh, insurance products, uh, and IULs, Index Universal Life. If you're interested in learning more about that, go to sunpalmfinancial.com. You can select uh, a date on our calendar there and set an appointment or just shoot us an email. We'd love to talk to you about that. All right, so as we kind of left off before the break, one of the questions was, what is the U.S. dollar backed by? If it's not backed by gold, and we talked about how the U.S. government is a corporation, and therefore that corporation uh, is sort of um, the backbone of how our country operates and how our financial system uh, operates. And so therefore, um, what is backing it? Well, you are. Full faith and credit of the U.S. government, our stability as a nation, our um, our economy, these sorts of things. But there's a few other things. Do you have a call? We do have a caller. Uh, Jamie is joining us, and you have a question. Hey, Jamie, you're on the air, sir. Super great question. Um, so technically, yes, we are in a recession, and here's what that means. Uh, the definition of recession is, is kind of debated sometimes. What is a recession is the first question, I guess, right? So <clears throat> a recession is basically where we have two consecutive quarters of um, non-production uh, in the GDP. So like, for instance, um, uh, two consecutive quarters of declining growth, essentially, all right? Uh, so many countries adhere to that. Now, National Bureau of Economic Research looks at various uh, factors when deciding whether or not we're in a recession. Um, so the Institute, um, they define it as a significant, this is a quote, a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, normally visible in production, employment, uh, real income, and other indicators. So if that's the definition, we are in a recession. Uh, the GDP, uh, two bad quarters of non-growth, that's a recession. So any way you look at it, we definitely are in a recession. However, we did get some pretty good economic numbers that came out in the last quarter. Uh, that saved us. Uh, it really kept us uh, teetering above that line. Uh, as we look into the next uh, quarter or so, we're going to really see how things play out, and that's part of the topic here today. Uh, we're going to be factoring in not only the strength of the banks, but also some huge challenges that may be on the horizon for them. So great question. So yes, we are technically in a recession. We're not feeling it in a big way yet um, because we had some good economic growth, which kind of stabilized us. Um, and so the future is, is the big question mark. So we'll have to pull out the crystal ball here uh, shortly. Um, so now we were talking about the U.S. dollar, what backs it. One of the things that backs it, uh, the U.S. dollar has often been called the petrodollar. All oil, uh, gasoline and such um, is purchased and traded in U.S. dollars. So they call it the petrodollar. So as long as the U.S. dollar is being the currency that's uh, the exchange currency for um, uh, global energy, that keeps us pretty strong. This is why we have a good relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
uh, Trump established a very good relationship with them um, and their new um, crown prince. And so we see a lot of um, good relationship that was built there that can capitalize on. And where that happened, by the way, is uh, back in the day when oil was discovered uh, in those regions of the Middle East, we immediately rushed in as US government and we established these agreements. We funded a lot of the, um, the growth and, and getting that oil out of the ground. And therefore we established these agreements with OPEC um, which is the governing body of, of, of the oil region um, to basically have the uh, US dollar as the currency that it's all traded in. There's also another thing that people don't understand or maybe they're new to the idea is the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. So what does that mean? That, that's essentially that uh, whenever you're um, as a country, you're doing global trade, it's done in US dollars. So the US dollar is very powerful and very influential. And by the way, when we're talking about OPEC, and we're talking about the, the petrodollar, this is why you see us always engaged in these wars in the Middle East, right? Uh, we've got to protect our interests, right? Uh, when we had the, um, the first uh, Gulf War, uh, a lot of people don't even know what that was about. So Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait that triggered this uh, this war in Iraq and we went over there and you know had a big war the first time and then second time around but what started that first war was uh, Iraq had accused Kuwait of doing lateral drilling underneath from their their country underneath the ground into Iraqi oil reserves so they decided to invade to protect their interests well of course we wanted to protect our interest and therefore we had a war and so just don't want to get into it too much but you understand how uh, how this plays out now uh, so with the reserve currency very similar situation so we have this reserve currency um, um, that the world deals in and by doing so uh, it keeps us strong but there are some new things on the horizon when it comes to our reserve currency and we'll talk about that here in a second. Looks like we have another caller coming in. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I think uh, nothing there. So I think they'll have to redial. <laughs> OK, if, if that was you, go ahead and redial 772-340-1590. So if we are the world reserve currency, what would happen if there was another country who was strong, another country who had a great economy, another country who had stability, what if they came along and became an alternative? And what would happen to the US dollar if it shifted to another currency? Now, the first question is, okay, well, what country could compete with us in that regard? Well, we have Russia. Uh, they're pretty big and they're pretty stable. Uh, we've done a million sanctions against them with this war in Ukraine, and we've also taken our reserve. We've seized our their reserve currency in U.S. dollars, and they just uh, produced uh, a fifth. Uh, I think they were the fifth country in the in the world that uh, for GDP last year, and first in uh, Europe. So obviously, they've insulated themselves from this problem because it didn't affect them at all, uh, or very little. So Russia could be, uh, China could be another. And there are other things that we haven't really thought about, and I'll, I'll kind of tune you into BRICS. You say, what is BRICS? BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. So this is a collaboration of multiple countries coming together. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That's where this acronym comes from. So there was talk last year <clears throat> about creating their own type of currency that would rival the US. And in doing so, they could relieve themselves of having to have the US dollar as the global uh, reserve currency. So uh, this is a quote from Brazil's president, um, said uh, that they don't believe nations that don't use US dollars should be forced to trade in the currency. And he has also advocated for a common currency and the um, South American countries, uh, a BRICS currency is what they're kind of calling it, uh, basically increases our payment options and reduces our vulnerability. So that, that was uh, from Brazil. So the other countries involved were asked about this because they met, all got together and they had this meeting 
So when they came out of the meeting, people started to ask, is this what you're trying to do? And it was very hush hush. Some totally denied it. Uh, some were very secretive about it. Uh, China especially was very secretive about it, Russia. But uh, if you watch the interview with Tucker Carlson with uh, Putin recently, Putin hit on this. And he talked about how overnight, if that were to shift, the US economy would be in collapse. So that full faith and credit in the US government uh, could shift drastically. Now, we're a big country and we've been doing this for a long time, we're very successful. Um, and of course, the petrodollar and, and whatever, but things could shift. And um, so this is something that you have to think about when you're looking at the stability of the US banking system. And also, when we're looking out in the future, <clears throat> what is the reverberating effect if we have an economy? Now, in 08, uh, we saw what happened. It caused a global problem. And when we come back from our break, we're going to kind of look at where things were then and where things are now and kind of get a picture of the future. Why is old money respected more than new? It's not because new money spends their fortunes outrageously and the old money gets jealous. Old money is respected because it has grown over time and is maintained over many, many generations. You see, most new money will be blown eventually or wasted by the second generation. And the descendants of new money just get poorer and poorer after that. But at Sunpond Financial, we'll help you to create generational wealth that will grow with each new chapter. So if you've been fortunate enough to come into some new money, or right now to schedule your free consultation so that you can join the old club, Sunpond Financial, invest, grow, protect, sunpondfinancial.com. Dreams. What do your dreams look like? And how far are you willing to chase them before giving up? Or are you willing to stay the course to achieve them? Do you dare believe? Are you willing to work for them, strive hard to never give up until they are realized? Are your dreams worth chasing? Well, if they are, Welcome to Sun Palm Financial, a place where dreams become a reality. Whether your dream is to grow and to thrive towards the good life or to simply experience freedom through financial security, come share your dreams with us. Sun Palm Financial, invest, grow, protect. SunPalmFinancial.com All right, welcome back to the Sun Palm Financial Broadcast. And we're talking today about the US banking system and the financial system in, in, uh, as a whole. Um, and we're also looking at some challenges in the future. We've caught a lot of calls today. This has really woken a lot of people up, I think. Uh, some new information that they may not have known. Uh, we were just talking about the reserve currency um, of the world, which is US dollar, also called the petrodollar because our uh, OPEC um, countries, our, our uh, oil is traded that way. Oh, got another call here. This is from Brenda, Port St. Lucie. Brenda, would love to hear what you think. What's on your mind? Yes. That's true, yeah. Right. 
right? Right, right. Well, it's a great, great point. What would we find, <laughs> right? What would we find, Brenda? And also the question would be, if they find that it's not what they expected, could that cause an economic crash? People say, oh, well, the US dollar really doesn't have a whole lot of backing to it, for instance, and therefore it could cause some problems for us. Um, and we're already kind of teetering on uh, this recession. So that might make it worse. So you can kind of understand that perspective as well. But, but you're right, uh, politics and policy in particular definitely, definitely drive our financial um, way of doing business. But what's even scarier, I would submit to you, is stepping out of the politics of Democrat versus Republican. Behind the scenes, you have non-elected bureaucrats pulling the strings. And so, so this is where I think, and I'm going to hit on that in just a minute, this is where I think we have many uh, issues. Um, so we may have to actually roll this one into a part two for next week because some of this information is pretty heavy. So uh, thanks for calling, Brent. I'm going to get into that right now. You've prompted me, so I'll, I'll do that. By the way, if you have uh, some uh, feedback, folks, you can call us 772-340-1590. That's 772-340-1590. All right, so if we stopped being the world's reserve currency, that could have a catastrophic effect on our economy clearly. Um, but also, let's not forget, our economic stability, if people see us as unstable, then that could prompt them as well to kind of move into another type of currency as the world reserve currency. That's why it's so important that our monetary policy in the United States is doing, you know, the things that we need it to do to show stability. So what caused this trigger in 2023? to cause these five bank failures and what happened in the past. Well, I've gone ahead and pulled some numbers. Uh, Bankrate.com had a list of failed banks. So in our last economic collapse, the Great Recession that we had, uh, back in 2009, we had, and this is to give you a scale, 140 banks went under. In 2010, 157 banks went under. And 2011, 92, 2012, 51, 2013, 12, 2014, 18. So those are huge numbers. We're not seeing that right now. Um, so maybe you could look at that and say, okay, well, then that's good. We, we passed this great recession. We're not in the same danger that we were back then. Uh, how did we bail ourselves out of these five banks? And what does it look like in the future? So really good, um, really good question. What stopped the bleeding? Well, the Federal Reserve, they stepped in and they bailed out the big, uh, these banks. And also something that we hadn't really seen before, the big banks jumped in as well. So more than 400 billion was uh, given in direct support, guaranteeing all deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and US uh, Federal Reserve was on the hook for 140 billion of that. Wow. So when they collapsed, 140 billion uh, were on the hook for it. Uh, and then there was another uh, 54 billion. Uh, the, I'm sorry. It says then there was 54 billion the Swiss National Bank offered Credit Suisse. So did it go global? Yes, it did. Credit Suisse uh, was essentially going under. And then uh, UBS uh, came in and uh, basically gobbled them up for pennies. And this is something that we're seeing also on top of um, the amount of money that banks were borrowing to sustain themselves, they borrowed 153 billion from the Fed uh, in recent days, <clears throat> smashing the previous record of 112 that was set in 2008. Uh, so these banks were, were borrowing money from the Fed, the, the ones that fell, uh, the banks were being, um, the, the deposits were being paid out by the Fed. And so, you know, this emergency lending program was in effect and so on. And then something else interesting happened. The big banks also stepped in and they gave money to the smaller banks. So why would they do that? Why wouldn't you allow your competition or the smaller banks to fail? Well, I'll tell you why. It's, uh, it's all about investing, people. 
You buy low, you sell high. That's how you make lots of money, right? So if you have banks that are, their stock price has gone all the way down to very little because they're bleeding out of the nose. People have come and said, I want my money and the banks can't give it to them because they've lent out too much. Um, then the stock price goes down. The big banks, they'll go in and they'll say, we'll bail you out with this loan. And in return, we don't want interest. We want your stock. So now that smaller bank is low on their stock price. The second they get that injection of cash, they're bailed out. Everybody feels good about, oh, good, our bank is saved. Stock price does what? Skyrockets. So now they've just made a bunch of money off of their competition. And some of them are also getting interest on top of that. So this is the game, and this is how it's played. And the problem that you see when that happens is we're creating these super banks, these huge giant conglomerates, and this causes uh, a whole nother situation. If there's a monopoly almost, or there's only a few banks that run everything, um, naturally they can set the interest rates higher uh, collectively. They can, you know, literally five people can come into a room and say, hey, we're gonna set the interest rates for this to be this and this to be that. Now I know that the Fed sets the rate, but that's the borrowing rate. The banks set the rate that they wanna charge on, uh, above that, right? So kind of scary when you think about it that way. So a um, couple numbers here, uh, banking industry uh, coughed up billions. It says JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America and Citigroup are among 11 lenders that provided 30 billion cash influ infusion aimed at shoring up confidence in First Republic Bank alone. Uh, and then H, uh, HB, HSBC had reportedly committed more than 2 billion uh, to Silicon Valley Bank's UK business um, and so definitely a lot of uh, things happening in the background there. So is your money safe? Should you put your money in a bank? It's a uh, deposit. Uh, they're insured up to 250,000 here in the United States. Um, joint accounts. I think it's 500,000 now. So is it safe? Do you want to have your money backed up by this uh, FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation? Um, maybe not. I would look at always diversifying your investments, um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, maybe a portion over there, maybe some in CDs. Um, and I hit on annuities as a big one. Like I said, at sunpalmfinancial.com, if you come talk to us, that's something we're seeing a lot of. People have figured out the game because think about it for a minute. The Federal Deposit Insurance, keyword, corporation. So who bails out the banks? The insurance companies bail out the banks. Why? Because they operate on a different set of rules. I'll give a for instance real fast. When you go, and we talked about this cost of living last week, when you go to, the, um, to get your house insurance, you pay a significant portion of your premium right up front, right? So what do they do? Well, they've got that money and they stick that in an account and they're getting, gaining big interest and they're doing things with it and then you're paying the rest of your premium throughout the year. The amount of money, and that's referred to in some cases as comp core, which is where these, all these insurance companies collectively uh, have this account, if you wanna call it that. Comp core is the GDP or the, uh, the amount of, of uh, whole countries, the amount of money that's sitting in there. Uh, Lloyd's of London, for instance, insurance company, right? So these, these companies, they have hordes of cash, big, big, big numbers. They are so financially strong. And this is why we've talked about bank failures. We've also seen some um, investment uh, firms, Bear Stearns being one of them, Shearson Lehman Brothers and other huge ones that went under. So we've seen big banks go under, Washington Mutual. Uh, we saw uh, Wachovia be uh, gobbled up by Wells Fargo because they were about to go under. So some of the biggest banks in the nation, we've seen those failures. We've seen stock market crashes, and we have seen these um, investment firms go under. But you don't really hear in the sphere of finance, big insurance companies, these huge ones, ever having these types of collapses. That's why it's a safe place to put your money. Again, sunpalmfinancial.com, reach out to us and we can talk to you about what, uh, where things are with that and we can get you placed 
Um, but just be aware, as we're getting wrapped up here, be aware that some of these investment firms may not want to let your money go. We had a client that was moving it from a brokerage account, and it took, I'm not joking, one month to get that investment firm, um, that, that company, to transfer the funds. They did everything imaginable to not have to let go of that money. Uh, I don't want to say the name of the company because it probably wouldn't be right. But at the same token, the reason why is after COVID, a lot of people uh, were having to just access their money. And there were some huge mergers that happened in that scope of, of things. Um, so that kind of caused uh, them to be overextended. For instance, uh, Charles Schwab completed an acquisition in 2020 of TD Ameritrade, so one of their biggest competitors, and that was in 2020. We know what happened after that. Well, COVID happened. So people were pulling their money out of um, Charles Schwab right and left. And so they had announced just last year a $500 million cut per year. And that's going to be going forward. That cut is going to be involving real estate and jobs. So they just, I guess, weren't ready for that. So you're starting to see a lot of these investment firms not want to let go of the money. Uh, you'll hear bad things about annuities. They're putting out ads about it because they don't want to see their money go away. But that that's one of the safer places right now um, to plug into. Um, and there are some other things too. People talk about gold. Should I invest in gold? As a hedge, absolutely. Um, but it's not really going to gain you interest to live off of. But it is a good hedge. Um, I'll tell you one quick story, and I think we're going to be wrapping up. We'll have to go to uh, part two. Uh, well, actually, tell you what, I'll tell you the story next week. Um, we thank you for tuning in. We'll have to make this a part two. We've had a lot of calls today on this subject. So sunpalmfinancial.com to hear more about us. And you've been listening to the Sun Palm Financial broadcast every Wednesday I heard here on WPSL at 11 o'clock. Join us again next week.